Hello there. Welcome, Tian Wong, to the Dating Advisory Board. I'm so very thankful for you to be here today. Um, you're one of my dear friends and mentor. Um, today, we're going to talk tech. All right, Tian, let me give you a little brief background on him. Tian is a tech CEO and angel investor. He is chairman of Tech 2000, a Virginia-based ed tech company that provides advanced tech training, mobile e-learning, and software development to Fortune 500 customers. He is also chairman of the IT services company, Lore Systems, and founder host of Big Idea Connectpreneur Forum, a community of over 5,000 business leaders that meet quarterly. And that's coming up next week, so if you haven't got your tickets, we were just talking about that they are gonna be selling out. Um, Tien was also appointed by Governor Martin O'Malley to a nine-person Maryland Venture Fund Authority, which oversees $84 million in venture capital allocations. Tien serves on many advisory boards. Here are just to name a few. Montgomery County Economic Development Corp., Trade Up Capital Fund, Potomac Officers Club, Founders Corps, Commonwealth of Virginia Center for Innovative Technology Gap Fund, Digital DC Tech Fund. He's also a mentor at Mach 37 Cybersecurity Accelerator and Conscious Venture Labs. Tian is recognized as an international expert in CRM, direct marketing, and BPO. He has presented at dozens of conferences all around the world. He's also provided industry commentary on ABC, Fox, NBC, CNBC, Maryland Public Television, and China CCTV networks, as well as for publications such as Time Magazine, The Washington Post, Inc. Magazine, and Success Magazine. So welcome, Tian. Thanks, Jen. Yes. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, really. I'm really... Thank you. I've been, I'm really excited. I know you're, you've been uh, doing a great job with it, so... Oh, thanks thank for you. thanks for having me on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you really pushed me. You kind of known me about this from the very beginning and helped me. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, but I really want to know because you are. Becoming... Do I get credit for the red? Yes. Heart and oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you and Molly and. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's fun. Yes. But yeah, thank you because I do go to my core tribe or my advisory mm -hmm. boards and personal and business, and I think it's so important that you have them in both. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm very fortunate that you <laughs> you are in my tribe. <laughs> so. My honor. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Um, but so you've been talking a lot about and in your articles with the Washington Business Journal, and I'm so interested to to hear your feedback and tell the audience about the article but how can businesses utilize Snapchat? I right. Mean, so, you know, people view Snapchat as this kind of kids app or high school or sexting app, when in reality, it's they should take a different view and say, this is where a lot of the uh, future attention of the consumer will be. Because like Facebook did 10 years ago, Snapchat will eventually, quote, age up. Right. And you're going to see older demographies and... Um, people that can actually spend money and, and be customers join Snapchat for whatever reason, maybe mm -hmm. to follow their kids, maybe to uh, out of interest because it's a great messaging app. Right. So, you know, right now Snapchat's number two behind Facebook. It's ahead of Instagram. It's got a hundred million plus daily active users or active daily users and, and, and like something like 10 billion or 12 billion daily views. Wow. So it's a substantial platform. And I really think that, if businesses, especially B2C companies, but B2B also, if they ignore this platform, um, it'll be at their own peril. Maybe right. they can ignore it right now, mm -hmm. but I joined Facebook 10 years ago. I, I needed my college ID to join back then, and nobody was on Facebook. I was on Facebook because a lot of my buddies out on the West Coast in the investment and tech community were, so I jumped on there, and then people were wondering, why am I on Facebook? Well, you know, five years later, there's no wondering of that. Right. So, um, you know, maybe it is very early right now, but I think in the in the next two, three, four years, it'll be a mainstream um, vehicle for any company to to utilize for for lots of different reasons. Yeah. Now, would you say um, now? Can you tell us kind of how the dynamics work? Because there's you can do photos, you can do your you have your stories, right? Yes. And you have so you kind of tell your story through through pictures or through video, and they're quick snippets, and they're only there for what, 24 hours. Yes, that's right. Um, but you can now save them. Yes. Right, and then you can push them to other social media flat platforms as well. Um, but what would you say? Um, how often are you snapping, or when do you think? I mean, how should companies? You know, start up if they're starting for, for right. you know, if they just signed up for Snapchat, what advice would you give? Yeah. Them? So the first thing is, what do you want to do with the platform? So businesses can use Snapchat for a, a bunch of different reasons. You can sell on it by offering coupons or special, you know, limited offer offers. Um, you can market 
and do business development on there. You can do use it for PR and branding. You can use it for recruiting people. You can use it to find opportunities. I mean, you know, there are some venture capitalists on the West Coast named Justin Kahn. He's using it to find deal flow. Oh. And then Ty Lopez, who you may know, he's also in LA. He uses it to find investors. So you can use it to find opportunities. And then you can also use it's a great learning platform as well. And also as a teaching platform. So businesses are probably looking to sell or market or brand or whatever. So once they kind of figure out what they want to do with it, then you can do different techniques. So there's, uh, yes, you're right about the stories part. So these are 10 second videos or photos, which can last up to 10 seconds and they disappear after 24 hours. You can save it to what they call something called memories. And also you can download it to your camera roll, right? You can download each snap to your camera roll and then repost it on something like Instagram stories. You can repost it on Facebook. Right. Yeah. I know. There's yeah. a, I love those filters. Um, the face, the, the geo filter. Oh, the filters on the face. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. And I do want to talk about the geo filters yeah. too, because I'll, I'll tie that back into connectpreneur, um, and get your opinion on this. So, um, the geo filters, I had one, have you seen the latest? Do you ever go do, do the face? face I ones? have not really, I've done a couple, but yeah. it's not my thing. Yeah. You know, you can have silly faces, dog faces, rainbows coming out of your yeah. mouth. Uh, they have a creative. very angry scroll right now. This okay. eyes, it's hilarious and it changes your voice. Uh -huh. So it's really actually uh -huh. pretty funny. No, but, um, so talk about that. Those, there's different types of filters like that. Yes. Right. And you can do the videos where you can take a picture with those, but also, um, the geo filter, so like for Connectpreneur, right, coming up, right? right. You can take those, you now how did you go about getting that? Tell us the process yeah. of getting your own so, geo filter. Yeah, before that, I did want to comment on the snap. So okay. you can take a video or a photo and then you can do whatever you want. You can draw on it, you can comment on it, you can put a meme on there. Um, you can you can put stickers, so, you know, million different stickers. You can get a Bitmoji, which is sort of a character, mm -hmm. cartoon character of yourself. And you can put that on there. So it, it allows for a lot of creativity. You know, they're viewed as a leader in what they call augmented reality, which is sort of an interim step till, till we reach full virtual reality. Um, but so that, that's true. So a lot of people are having a lot of fun with it. Even adults are. Right. So uh, that's it. And then a geofilter is basically a filter that is on your Snapchat. It's basically like a picture frame, custom, with your event or the date or your name or whatever you want on there. Um, that is basically geofenced. So if you pick this particular location or block or the hotel that we were at in June. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had a designer in Australia. Really? Her name is, look up String Story. Okay. Her name is Suzanne Nguyen. And she's a, also a, a brilliant Snapchat artist and teacher. She's and a consultant. So she developed the geo filter for us. And then we just uh, went on our Snapchat account and then you can put how long you want it on mm -hmm. the geography that you want it covered. And then they, they'll charge you accordingly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, can you keep that up there all the time or is it just, it like would cost you a lot of money. You could, yeah. it, would, it wow. would cost a lot of money to do that. Cool. So if you're going to hold a uh, dating advisory board happy hour or a, an event of some kind, you can create your own geo filter. Anyone who's using Snapchat after they take the video or photo, they just basically swipe right until they find your geo filter and then they would select it and then go from there. Oh, wow. That's really Great branding for a lot of B2C brands. You saw during the Pokemon Go days, mm -hmm. a lot of ice cream parlors and you know hamburger joints, they would have all these geo filters on there. It's great branding. Mm -hmm. And right now it's relatively inexpensive. But do you see that changing? I think as people supply demand, so as more demand comes in, the prices will go up, of course. But uh, right now, it's pretty much Wild West. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. Um, so <clears throat> how often would you say, like, oh, I want to get back to that. So, like, for, for me, so how often should I Snapchat the dating advisory board? Are you doing it, do you find yourself doing more pictures or more video or both? Or, I mean, are you... I mean, for me personally, I'm doing it because I'm learning about it. I'm having fun. I'm trying to build my personal brand. I also want to promote my companies. You know, I'd say it's 90% video, 10% photos. I do take still shots of different things, like if I have a table of contents of a book or so, mm -hmm. or, or a photo of something, or an outside a photo of a building. Um, but I think from what I've seen and read, you know, the, the, the experts out there say you want to do it every day. You want consistency. 
and eventually you build up an audience and people tune in. It's basically like a TV show. Right. So my story is like a TV show. I've got, you know, a loyal following of a few hundred people that watch my snaps every day. Right. I mean, there's people that have millions. Kim Kardashian, you know, DJ Khaled, they have millions of people that watch every snap. But um, so people will start tuning in. And I'm also a consumer of content. So I'll tune in to other people's shows. Right. And I look forward to it. Yeah. You know, like after dinner or something, I'll spend 20 minutes on Snapchat or whatever looking looking at other people's stories. Now, let me ask you a question on, I mean, how would you say, how do you get those followers? I mean, is it just, is there a database where you can say, like, here are the top influencers? I mean, I know, like, in an Instagram world, like, you're trying to connect with the inst with your in your business yeah. space with those influencers and try to get them to, you know, like your stuff or get involved. I mean, how do you even go about doing that in a Snapchat world? Right. It's going to take a long time. One of the Snapchat's weaknesses, or maybe it's a pro, but I think it's a weakness, is that they have a very, they have limited discovery capability or zero discovery capability. I can't find you on Snapchat. Hmm. So how do I do it? There are third party things like Snap decks. There's something called ghost codes, which you okay. can download. And then you can find people who have your interest and you can basically read their profiles and then decide whether or not you want to download their snap code or add them to Snapchat. And then you put your own profile up. And so there are some discovery tools out there. Also, um, you know, if you, if you read Ginny Can Breathe, that's uh, Virginia Salas. She, she wrote a great article on LinkedIn about how to increase your Snapchat followers. Okay. And basically it was, you know, put your name and your snap code everywhere on every platform, put it on medium, put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, and then also try to drive people to your Snapchat channel. So if you're big on Twitter or big on Instagram, you could say something like, Hey, go check my thing out, whatever that thing is right. on Snapchat. Here's my code. Follow me and then go see. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, keep the so interest out there. you want people to, to go yeah. to that channel. And then um, and then there's things you can do, like what they call Snapchat takeovers. Okay. So I can exchange accounts with you. So I would do a story on your account on whatever topic, and you would do a story on my account. And oh, that's we'd interesting. Put each other's, it's, it's a great way to grow. I've grown my following a lot by doing those takeovers too. Wow. Yeah. So it takes a lot of work. Right. It's not like you can go buy followers or, you right. know, um, it, so I think what it's doing is it makes the quality of Snapchat engagement and interactions is by far better than much better than Twitter. And Twitter's all noise, definitely better than Instagram. Um, and, I would say it's better than Facebook, too, in many ways, because there's more loyalty. There's more exclusivity. You can create more of a walled garden on Snapchat. OK. Yeah. So it's public, but it's really private. Right. It's private with a little bit of public, whereas Twitter is all public. Right. Pretty much. You know. Right. Right. So now let's try to when we talk about strategy, right? Yeah. Cause you deal with a lot of businesses. I, you know, I actually want to get into, you know, how you became an investor and mm -hmm. what makes startups stand out because, you know, dating is a lot like business. You have to have yeah. a strategy, right? You're just not going to go out and date everybody. <laughs> Weird, but, um, but you actually, you know, have to have a business plan. So, you know, what would be some of your first steps you would recommend if you're starting a business and a business strategy or a dating strategy? Right. So in business, you need a customer. That's your first, second and third priorities. Get a third party customer, solve a pain point for them in a way that's probably differentiated or better than your competitor. And I think I'm not an expert in dating. I've been off the market for, you know, 30 something years. But I would say that um, it's similar. You know, you you want to find a match. So you're looking for a quote customer, which would be mm -hmm. an ideal partner. And um, their pain point is they're looking for someone who fits whatever bills. And then you have your differentiating aspects, which is sort of your unique value proposition that you're bringing to the table. And then you can just kind of match that way. And then you, you can apply targeted marketing to your, uh, you know, to your targeted customer, try right. to f find patterns of where they, where they are, where, where's their attention? How can you access, how can you get to them? And then you can then deliver your messaging that way. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's directly applicable. I think, you know, my experience with dating was always serendipitous or just friends introducing you. And it wasn't really that kind of strategic right. <laughs> or tactical. Well, yeah, I mean, but yeah, that's the same thing. Like you have people that you refer other business partners to, like mm-hmm. we, both you and I refer a business. And, um, but that's, you know, same in dating is going back to those core groups and trying to ask for referrals yeah. and the people that you may or may, may not know. Um, so let's talk about um, Connectpreneur. So can you talk a little bit about how that started yeah. and give them a background? Yeah, so Connectpreneur, which is connectpreneur.org, that's our website, is, uh, is a community of over 5,000 CXOs and business executives in the Mid-Atlantic region. So we've been doing our quarterly half-day events now, both in Maryland and in Virginia, for about five, oh, over five years. This is our, our 20th events coming up next Wednesday, the 28th, at the Hyatt Regency in Bethesda. You know, we started at the Tower Club in Tyson's with 140 people, and I think we have like 550 coming next week. Yeah. But it's more than just the numbers of people because we try to keep the service provider count down so that we have more CXO to CXO networking. And it's a formula that works. I mean, when we built Connectpreneur, the the initial reason to do this event was to promote our companies, my companies. And we had done these high-level CEO events with custom speaker, uh, special speakers Every quarter, we would do them. And then what I found was that when we got 20 CEOs together, they just wanted to hang out with each other. So um, we just kind of said, why don't we just make this a bigger event? We didn't know how big it would get, but just make it mostly CEOs um, because that's what they want. And then I just said, look, I want to create an event that I would never want to miss, me personally. Because I'm sort of the target market. You know, I'm an investor and a CEO, so I'm the ideal market for the, the event. So it was kind of easy to create because you just say, okay, I like this. I don't like this. And then it's kind of grown from there. So, um, you know, initially it was to promote our companies. We got a lot of business out of it, but now it's become more as a service to the community. Mm -hmm. You know, now people are looking forward to it. It's actually taken on a life of its own. You know, we have our own website. We have our own Twitter handle at connectpreneur. We have a new Instagram page. And I don't know where it's going to go. You know, we're going to do our first event in Baltimore next year. Okay. So we'll do five events next year, two in Bethesda, one in Baltimore, and then two in Northern Virginia. And possibly go to North Carolina. I've got a number of people have called me about doing an event down wow. there. So, I mean, we can only do, we're not an events business, so we'll only do what we can manageably deliver on and know that we're going to do an A job on it. Right. So we'll see how it goes. But I love the community. It's a great way to see friends like yeah. you and others every quarter and add value to them. I, I love when I see people meeting, you know, making deals. Mm-hmm. Um, so you yeah. have those people that come up and like, what do, would you say? Because how many people are pitching their business? I mean, is it We 10? usually have eight, eight, eight okay. companies. Yeah, we've had as few as six and as many as 10, I think, one time. We found yeah. that eight, four and a half minute pitches is ideal Idea. for the uh, entrepreneurs that are yeah. pitching. Yeah. And what do you think? I know that Bob London of yes. London Marketing. He's one of our coaches. One of the coaches. Yep. How to perfect your pitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's very good at I it. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, and so I, what would you say to those out there who are looking for investment or looking for fund funding? What would you say that would stand out um, when pitching to investors? I think, first of all, you want to make sure you really want money because... If you take money from an, a venture capitalist, you have a good chance of getting fired. You know, a 50-50 shot. Within five years, you'll be fired. Um, if you take money from angels, that's a little bit better, but you are ceding some control. You're ceding mm-hmm. equity, obviously. But if you're sure you want to take the money, then um, then you need to, in my opinion, demonstrate that you are resourceful and you are... Um, coachable but most importantly that you can take a lot of punishment you can take the blows you can get beaten up and then keep getting up off the canvas you're going to get knocked down you just gotta so i'm looking for someone who can just continually not just get up but get up with more fire Mm -hmm. and that's really hard to it's really hard to identify how whether someone actually has the fortitude to survive because success is about survival it's right. just about the last person standing it's about being able to take the punishment and never quit right because a lot of people just quit too early right yeah so, so as an investor i want to invest in people who just i know they're going to be able to 
withstand all this mental, mostly mental toughness. Uh, yeah, mental torture. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. looking for very mentally strong people. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, um, when you look at, I think we had talked about this a while ago. Why I think it was. Um, Enterprise would hire all collegiate athletes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So NCAA athletes, and they mm -hmm. build their business back on that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are, have mental toughness. Yes. Because they're competitive, they want to win, right? Right, and they're they, goal they're oriented. They are and they're they coachable. Know what, they're coachable. They have to sacrifice. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know yeah. why more businesses are not going straight to the <laughs> athletic department of universities and saying, who's, yeah, and and um, and looking at that and scouting that way. I mean, yeah, no, I had my intern this summer is captain of the Cornell swim team. Billy, you've met her. She's an incredible swimmer. And I've got uh, two interns now. One is was a uh, on the Korean national team for soccer, wow. U15. And the other one played D1 basketball at no AU. tennis. Uh, no tennis players. Tennis players would be great, you know, but I just haven't. I think tennis just isn't as popular, unfortunately. Yeah. You know. Um, Don't tell me that. But, yeah, no, <laughs> t tennis players turn out to be really good business people, the ones that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Such as you well, and others. Thanks. <laughs> I yeah. appreciate that. Now, when you go, I want to go back on that. When you said people get discouraged, I mean, how do you tell them you know, if they say, oh, it just hasn't happened yet. You know, I'm getting frustrated. And we talk about the mental stuff. Like, how would you advise them if you, to do? Like, what, would, what would you advise them to do? I mean. Um, like, at what stage? How, how depressed are they? Are they way depressed. at the bottom or, <laughs> right. you know. Right. Um, yeah, we, we're at the bottom. But you know in your core that this is a really good product that, you know, if you just put a little bit more effort in or, or maybe change some things around, go back to your business advisory boardrooms. Yeah. So what would you yeah, say? Yeah, staying, staying up is very, very difficult. And I think that there's a few things. I mean, one is surround yourself with awesome people, teammates who can lift you and vice versa when times, times are tough. Mm -hmm. Two would be um, you want to have awesome advisors and mentors, people that know you and people that say, hey, don't worry about it. Remember that time you won, blah, blah, blah. Right. The third thing is... Um, the third thing is triggers. So a trigger could be a memory of a great shot. It could be a memory of a great win. It could be a, a song, a poem. So if you can build a library of triggers that can kind of snap you out of a funk. Right. And then another one that I use is I look at all the great things that I did for my customers. And I just try to have a tape playing in my head of all these great things my customers told me about how great our company is and how great our people are. So I'm like, okay, we got great customers. We're doing great things. We have great people. This is just a temporary setback. So it's really how you deal with adversity. Athletes have dealt with adversity since they were little kids. So they have a system for dealing with adversity. It's a lot easier for athletes, I think, or, or people that have been in competitive mm -hmm. endeavors of some kind. They're used to losing. So they mm -hmm. kind of figure out how to, how to get over that loss. Um, do you think so it's it's it I think it varies by person and some people are different some people need more of that interpersonal than others some people are more introspective and they can kind of work it through mm -hmm. but it's not easy it's extremely difficult yeah to I mean keep I know. coming back harder and harder mm -hmm. and harder you just have to have a fire I mean yeah. and and how do you get that fire is like the magic question right you know? I don't know if you're born with it I just know like if someone says well you can't do this or you're this or you're that if they're negative you know any sort of thing like that I just take that as fuel to for yes, my fire yes. I don't take it personally because it's clearly you know it's they're not the ones about that are me. messed up right yeah right no, so exactly. I actually I, I feed on that yeah I mean I think negative feedback is a great motivator yep. it's yeah. a phenomenal motivator yeah because they know? just want you to I mean for the most part they want you to be successful so I mean you're not always going to hear good things you're going to hear right. things that you need to work on or um, I mean so, yeah, so many successful people had some kind of deep-seated deep-rooted insecurity that drove them hard Bill Clinton Steve Jobs Larry Ellison I mean the, the list is endless whatever that was in their childhood or in their growing up that caused them to experience this emptiness or void or pain or whatever you want to call it it gave them unlimited reserves of yeah. fuel to achieve greatness right yeah. yeah. No, I think that's really good. Um, now, let's get back on the tech side. Um, how do you think the technology game has kind of changed overall with all the apps and with the dating world? Have you seen? I mean, it just seems to be kind of overwhelming. That's why we actually created the dating advisory board to mm -hmm. bring that strategy. I mean, coming from your background of 
you know, these apps. Which yeah. Is- I mean, everything's going mobile. Right. Everything is data driven now. So big data is huge. Um, you know, things are so say goodbye to the desktop. You know, everything's mobile. So any mobile apps that are whatever dating or otherwise, that's where it's going. Snapchat's very popular because it's uh, mobile first. They didn't have time to do a, uh, a desktop version. Um, you look at in China, you have WeChat, which was mobile first also. Okay. Um, and it makes sense. So I think having the ability to connect with people mob- mobile you know, in a yeah. mobile way, um, that's where it's going. So, you know, um, but it's te- technology is just, grown in so many ways you know the secure cyber security has come a long way yeah. telecommunications has come a long way your smartphone is now i think you can get a 256 g um iphone 7 which is you know multiples of what i had you know with desktops just a few years ago so you look at that and um and i think it's not just dating although i know your questions was about dating and i just don't have any answers on specific apps but just in general um, mm-hmm. business in general, there's, um, that's where it's going. Yeah. Right. We, we live in an app economy. Now there are companies in California that are not even building websites. They're just building, they're going straight to the mobile app. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so we have a few more minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would you say one of one piece of advice that you've heard along the way that changed your mindset in life or even in business? Yeah, in college, we had this club called the Dartmouth Entrepreneurs Club, and I was one of the co-founders, and we used to have all these great speakers come, and we used to have to write all these marketing pieces. Anyway, there was a a guy in New Hampshire uh, who started a chain called Carol Reed. His name was Charles M. Layton, and he had a great quote that uh, it's been in my mind ever since I was like, you know, 19, 20-year-old kid, and that is that street smarts beats the heck out of business, uh, street smarts beats the heck out of book smarts anytime. Mm. So, right, and I kind of knew that, but right when I sort of internalized that, I realized, you know, you can study all you want, that's great, but it's not about that. It's about your street smarts and your EQ and your Mm -hmm. interpersonal skills and things like that. Yeah. Your soft skills. Soft skills, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can hire, you can hire knowledge, you can hire brain power. Right. You can't hire people skills. No, no. You're either born. You cannot outsource people skills. No. It puts you at a big advantage. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying you can't win if you don't have people skills, but if you do have them, you're, you have a much higher chance to win. Right. And, yeah. a, you know, allocate out, you know, to other people what you know, focus on your strong point. That's right. Right. Focus That's on what right. you're really That's good right. at. Don't focus on improving your negatives. I mean, right. You, you can spend time improving your negatives, but play to your strengths. Right. If you have a huge serve and a huge forehand. Yeah. Go forget the about the back. Don't forget yeah. about the backhand. Just right. make it passable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just, and then just uh, run to the net. focus on your serve right. and your forehand. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jen. What yeah. would you? I want just tell us a little about how people can get in touch with you. Obviously, about Connectpreneur next week, but just in general. How right. Can- so my email is twong t w o n g at opus eight dot com. I'm on Twitter at tian wong t i e n w o n g. I'm on Snapchat at and Instagram at s t n wong. So please connect with me there. I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm pretty accessible um, on social media. Yeah. So. But thank you for for having me. Yeah, Yeah. I know. I really appreciate it. 